Good afternoon, everybody. I have a special guest today discussing animal vivisection. Um, with us, we have Francis Kashun with NEAVS, which stands for the New England Anti-Vivisection Society. We are gonna have a special report um, in light of COVID, in light of the coronavirus, in light of the vaccines, in light of the fact that human testing versus animal testing is now a hot topic. This is our expert, and we're really excited to have you today, Francis. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, and welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, and thank you for inviting me to the show. I am an attorney. I went to Lewis and Clark Law School's uh, animal law program and recently graduated in May of 2019. I got very interested in legislation while I was in school, mostly because I went thinking, that I would be doing litigation and enforcement, but ultimately found that legislation makes a little bit more sense for me personally. I would like to um, get to help work on create creating good laws as opposed to just enforcing laws after they're made. Um, so I found the New England Anti-Vivisection Society during my third year of law school and moved out to Washington DC. And now I get to lobby on behalf of animals specifically those who are in medical experiments and just experiments generally in labs. And you do this full time? Yes, I do. Okay, and tell us a little bit about the, um, do they call it N-E-A-V-S or do they actually say New England uh, Anti-Vivisection Society? Do That's a really great question. Um, our full name is a little clunky, especially with the vivisection in there for a lot of folks who maybe don't know that, especially on Capitol Hill. Yeah, so the animal testing. Yeah, so we go um, we go by Neves mostly, and only okay. really spell it out when asked. Yeah. Okay, and tell us a little bit about uh, the organization. How long has it been around? What what has it done in the past that's truly monumental? I, I'm learning myself right now, so uh, you know, please tell me. <laughs> yeah, of course. So Neves was established in 1895. We're actually one of the oldest animal protection organizations in the United States. And unlike our other animal protection counterparts, we focus specifically on animal experimentation issues. So since 1895, we have been working to free animals from labs and that fight is clearly still continuing. Um, we have a lot of different uh, ways and efforts that we go about this work through grassroots organizing, through confidential adoption partnership programs, through which we take animals out of labs legally, through working with legislatures, really just, it's, you know, it's, we try to be creative and we certainly are trying every aspect that we can think of to help animals who do are you suffering have, like, Do you have like um, one thing that you guys have accomplished in the past while you've been there that you're super proud of? Yeah, actually um, there was a bill, a couple, it was last year, I think, um, AB 20 or AB uh, 700 in California, it was a lab gag bill, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. They're similar to- um, Gag gag? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's essentially saying that information in labs about animals could be seen as more confidential and therefore wouldn't be released to the public. It was in California and Neves heard about it and pretty quickly with activists and with Neves working round the clock on it, we got it to be taken, oh, it, it just died. So that was a really exciting, uh, that was a very exciting accomplishment to be part of. And um, with COVID right now, because this is what's front and center with headline news and world news, everybody's talking about a vaccine, right? The race to the cure, the race to the vaccine. What, if anything, are you guys doing um, in light of COVID or how has COVID changed your approach to animal testing? That's a great question. And the short answer is it has changed a lot, but the long answer is that right now, a lot of efforts are happening to address COVID-19, of course. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that animal experimentation efforts or anti-animal experimentation efforts can't happen. So while things have changed a little bit, certainly they've slowed down or they're having to be altered. For example, the work that I do is I do in-person meetings every single day. I go into congressional offices, I meet with congressional staff, and I discuss animal protection legislation. That doesn't happen as easily now because everything is forced to be remote. 
However, that doesn't mean it stopped either. So again, we are being creative. And the nice thing about Neves is that this isn't our first pandemic. We were around for the Spanish flu in 1918. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And we <laughs> basically just kind of have to adapt. And so right now we are figuring out ways to do that. And I'm really excited because the team that I work with, we're still being extremely productive and we're still figuring out ways to help animals. Additionally, we use the F Freedom of Information Act on the federal level and we use every single state's public records laws to get public information about what's happening to animals in labs in parts so that we understand what's happening and in parts so that we can tell the public what's happening. So right now we are sending FOIAs out and public records requests out specifically about COVID. As we've seen, there's been tons of mass euthanasia that's ex that's been happening, and PETA on social media has certainly been leading, you know, shedding light on that issue. But with COVID happening, the first thing that these labs decided to do was to cull populations by killing hundreds of thousands of animals. We don't even know how many at this point. Um, there was uh, an academic on Twitter who recently but said, "These that, animals, you know, these are animals that were going to be tested for." For animal testing, these aren't farm animals that are being culled or slaughtered for, you know, food production. This is totally different, right? Yes. Yeah, so these are just animals in labs who are seen or were seen prior to this pandemic as being critical test subjects. However, mm -hmm. as soon as this happened and the stay-at-home orders were put into place and lab scientists couldn't get to the labs as easily they were just, it was decided that these animals were expendable enough that they could just be mass slaughtered. And that's the evidence that we've been seeing through different FOIA requests, also through um, different, we follow a few different academics on Twitter, one of whom said that she was the grim reaper of mice, which we think is an upsetting, you know, deviation from mm -hmm. proper animal welfare. Uh, so what are you guys doing to stop that animal culling or, slaughter of these animals that are, you know, were set to be tested and now during this pandemic aren't being tested. Are you guys doing anything to stop that? So right now we are at sort of an information gathering phase. So everything has happened so quickly with COVID's development. And now that we understand there are likely going to be multiple waves of this, we're really trying to figure out the full extent of the problem. From there, we will hopefully be able to implement or at least help reform some of the processes and standards in the industry. Specifically, we're hoping that this might be a time for some pretty big reform so that the ease of research and so that the labs themselves can kind of look at the situation and determine how they wanna proceed after this pandemic. Do they want to just uphold tradition? Do they want to continue getting the same amount of grant money to have animals they don't deem as necessary? Or is this a great opportunity for some change to really be implemented. Mm -hmm. And are you lobbying through Zoom or how are you lobbying right now in the pandemic? Right now, it's totally up to the congressional offices. Mm -hmm. So far I have done over the phone, uh, have not done a whole lot of video calls. However, those are always on the table. It's really just a matter of what the congressional offices are comfortable with. And the reports that I've gotten from congressional staffers who I'm talking to, report that it's somewhere between order and chaos, but they're not to a place of normalcy yet, basically trying to figure out next steps of how they're going to proceed, considering this is probably going to be something that we experience for the long haul. So kind of mm -hmm. playing by ear for now and excited to see what this really develops into. Mm -hmm. So before the show, you sent me an email, um, which was a sort of a legislative roundup of a bunch of different animal protection acts that had to do with animal testing. Can you tell me a little bit about that and why you got into this legislative roundup? Because I know you said you're not involved in every single one of those pieces of legislation. Yeah, absolutely. So initially we decided to make a collection of the different legislation specifically for congressional staff so that we could inform them the entire about the entire space regarding animal experimentation. We work with Lewis and Clark Law School's Animal Law Clinic and specifically clinical professor Kathy Hessler on this uh, roundup. And it is a breakdown of every single state and federal law currently pending about animal experimentation. The way that congressional offices work are that they are very busy. The legislative branch is incredibly swamped 
all the time. And when I go into a meeting, sometimes they've just spoken to somebody else about a defense issue or about a health issue or something so unrelated. So while they have the animal welfare portfolio, they don't have necessarily the bandwidth to know every issue. So we decided to put this legislative roundup together for them so that I could take it in and show them, look, if you're interested in this space, then these are all the different bills that are currently pending. This is the bill I'm here to talk about today, but I just wanted you to see the full picture. Mm -hmm. And we found that it's extremely useful and helpful. Mm -hmm. Are there any bills on that roundup? Because there were quite a few that you would like to discuss today. I think um, the Humane Retirement Act, uh, you're more involved in than some of the others. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, so the Humane Retirement Act is the bill that I am currently working on and that Neves is working on the most on the federal level. It is a bill that was introduced by representatives Kathleen Rice and John Katko in May of 2019. The basic idea behind this bill is that at this point in time, even though it's state law in 12 different states, there is no federal mandate saying that after research is complete, animals used in the research should have the opportunity or consideration for adoption. And this federal bill would change that. So and what kind of animals are we talking about? So for this specific bill and for the bills on the state level, it's cats and dogs currently, which we would like to see at Neves, all species of animals in labs be rescued after experiments happen. Um, however, at this point in time, the infrastructure is set up for taking dogs and cats out. If you get a hundred dogs, it's easier to place them than if you get 100 primates. However, if Neves were offered to get 100 primates, I'm sure we would figure out what to do with them. And how do they get these dogs and cats? How do these dogs and cats get to be so unlucky? It's really, uh, that's a great question. Basically, a lot of the animals that we see in labs are either wild caught or they are from breeders who specialize in breeding animals specifically for laboratory use. So a Why lot is that of even necessary? I mean, with all the animals that are put down at animal shelters because they can't get homes, why are we breeding more animals to suffer? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense. However, there are also mandates. Uh, the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act, which is the first version of the current Animal Welfare Act, which was passed in 1966, it was aimed at not taking dogs and cats out of shelters to put them into labs. And there is always legislation pending about that because that's something that um, Americans are very uncomfortable with. And also it's just- I mean, how... yeah, I mean, and on one hand, you don't want these animals to be tested at all, but there's so many already suffering in these shelters and these county shelters at our kill facilities. It just seems ludicrous that they we would be breeding them uh, for the whole purpose of suffering. Doesn't Absolutely. Are you guys, do you guys have any, do you have any legislation about that? Are you proposing any legislation or you just know of legislation that's always existing around this issue? We have not, we don't have any currently pending around this issue. However, we are working on a campaign currently targeted specifically towards the production of the animals and seeing what that looks like, because this is an issue that makes us incredibly uncomfortable, of course. And it's something that we are working on and basically the way that we get to the point where we're having a congressional office introduce legislation or start up legislative efforts is we start with a whole bunch of research. We get the idea, we do a ton of background research, and then we take it to different congressional offices with whom we usually have relationships and kind of know where they fall on issues and say, hey, we have these three ideas. Would you be interested in taking any of these forward? And if so, we would love to be helpful and how can we do so? So this is definitely something that is on our radar. It is a campaign that's very close to a couple of my colleagues and my hearts, um, all of our hearts really. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the breeding of animals is insane to be. Yeah. They shouldn't be breeding. They shouldn't be using animals in general period and a story not from anywhere. Um, it's not necessary, especially with the um, human on a chip. Right? Do you know about that? The human on technology? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know much about it, but it just seems to me that cats, dogs, mice, they don't need to be tested at all anymore. Breeding them is just horrific. Using them in general is not necessary and probably obsolete based on the human and a chip. Um, tell us about that. Absolutely. So there are a handful of different alternatives to animal testing that are much more human relevant. And while I'm not an expert on this issue at all, 
I have read some, you know, some resources, specifically Aisha Akhtar's. She does a ton of amazing work on, on uh, alternatives, but there are quite a few different ways that we can get more human relevant alternatives to animal testing, including using a specific human's own cells in order to do tests. So one of the major failings that makes animal tests not super effective, and that's not just me saying it, the FDA and NIH have each said that between about 92 to 95% of animal tests that are successful in the animal-based model then fail in the human model. So this is, science is showing us that animal tests aren't effective. However, if you take a uh, human's own cells and then you do the test in, with the organ on a chip or any other types of tests, a lot of computer model models also exist um, with technology continuously uh, advancing, only alternatives are only going to become better. And then you also can eliminate the different issues of using animals in labs. For example, animals in labs live an unnatural lifestyle. They live in windowless basements with no access to sunlight. They don't have any sort of semblance of what their natural habitat would be like. And that isn't going to give you the best results because ultimately that animal isn't in a natural situation. Additionally, each individual is different. And therefore, while a test may work or you can say that it worked on one individual, a different individual, that might not be the same experience for that because every single individual is different. There are so many different variables that you have to, you know, you have to think about in the lab setting for it to be even somewhat useful. And I just don't think that that's possible, especially considering the numerous amounts of critical and non-critical and direct all of the different violations that we're finding in these labs who are violating the Animal Welfare Act. Mm -hmm. Speaking of animal welfare, I just want to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying that we should use shelter animals, um, you know, and cats and dogs. I'm just saying it's ridiculous to be breeding cats and dogs to be tested, especially in light of all the information you just said about human on a, what is a human on a chip or human organ on a chip? What's I think it's proper? organ on a chip, yeah. It's so organ on a chip. Um, how far off are we from this organ on a chip really making animal testing obsolete? So I think that's probably a question more directed towards when are we going to start putting more funding into alternatives? At least that's the way that I view it. So right now, if we put all of the grant money that we see being funneled into different universities to study the animal model, if instead that money were redirected toward the alternatives, then the alternatives would just start to boom. That industry would be pretty quickly developed so that it could be more useful, but ultimately without knowing when we're going to start moving more away from the animal-based experiments, which there has been a decrease in the past few years, certainly, but until we can really see that shift, we're not going to know exactly when those alternatives are going to be available. However, hopefully soon, especially because there are so many companies that are dedicated to working on them. Mm -hmm. And with this um, human organ on a chip, versus animal testing. And now what we're facing with the coronavirus, trying to come up with a vaccine, what are we actually doing to come up with a vaccine? Are we using organ on a chip? Are we using humans as now tests like we would normally do animal experimentation? What is the difference now that the landscape has changed in this pandemic? Yeah, so there are quite a few species who are being used for animal tests right now. I know that they're using some forms of primates. They're also using rabbits, hamsters, mice and rats, of course. But basically right now, they're kind of just, I think, scrambling to try anything and everything. But I haven't seen anything about the use of alternatives to animal testing on um, for coronavirus specifically. I do know that they have moved away from animal tests or kind of skipped that phase in order to hopefully rapidly find a vaccination. Um, but right now, I kind of think that whatever they can do, they are doing. And that also extends to grants. So grant money that went into a specific grant, a university or an entity doing animal testing can now take that money that maybe was initially for cancer research and it can repurpose it for coronavirus research, animal-based or not. But I think right now it's just a complete scramble in the state of a, you know, 
public health crisis. Right. And in light of this public health crisis, how do you think the public's attitude has changed towards animal testing? So that was something that initially concerned me quite a bit. I was worried that after seeing how scary this is, people would rely more heavily on animal testing. However, I was reminded that since 1895, public opposition to animal testing has continuously increased and it still is increasing. According to a 2018 Pew Research poll or Pew Research Center poll, the majority of Americans, 52%, oppose animal testing. Mm -hmm. According to a Gallup poll from that same year, 46% oppose animal testing, and that's a more conservative number. However, they were looking at trends in the past couple of years, and they projected that by 2021, a majority of Americans would oppose animal testing. So I think what's really important- Are we at that? Where are we now? Are we close to that majority? I believe so. Yeah, I think that the number that I tell congressional offices and that I see cited most often at this point is 52 percent. And that's just basic. Don't want animal testing. Americans against animal testing. That's not saying it's happening to dogs or that it's happening to primates or that it's happening to animals without any pain medication. Those, if you ask people those questions, it makes them even more uncomfortable and opposition increases. Right. Okay, um, you sent me a couple of uh, email attachments I'd like to put up on the screen and have you explain what we're looking at. Um, the first one is this map here. Um, what is this? So basically, this is Neves. <laughs> Neves decided to embark on a project through which we took all of the USDA's data from the past couple of years, since I think 2015. And we organized it so that we could see trends. We could see from 2015 to 2018, which labs were using animals, what kinds of animals, how many animals, that kind of thing. And then so from that- like, What does the red, yellow, green, and black mean What are when we look at this? Yeah, so these are just the number of animals in each of these places. Um, these are also only AWA protected animals. Uh, the Animal Welfare Act defines animals so as to exclude mice, rats, and birds. And mice and rats are the most often used animals in animal research. So this is really reflecting only those animals that are protected. So your primates, your cats, your dogs. Um, but this is an aggregation of information from 26 to tw 2016 to 2018 of the number of animals um, in, in labs, just the total, and, just breaking it down. And how many animals in labs are there a year in the United States, do you know? It's kind of hard to tell considering we don't know about mice and rats because they're not counted because they don't receive that AWA protection. However, That's from isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's something that we're that is something that's definitely on our radar and we're working on. But hundreds of thousands of animals are in labs um, based on species. It's and uh, out of that hundreds and thousands that are in labs, how many of them are euthanized or put down every year or die from being experimented on? Do you have those figures? Unfortunately, that's something that we don't know necessarily. We do have an idea that most of them are euthanized because there isn't a mandate to do any sort of adoption. And even in the states that do have adoption law, post-research adoption laws, we don't know because there aren't reporting requirements with those laws. So we don't have a way to figure that out right now. We mm -hmm. are always using the public records laws, though, to get as much information and to sort of, it's kind of like a big puzzle. And we're working on getting pieces together so that we can see the full picture and so that we can be more effective in our work to protect animals. Okay, and good work. I hope you guys keep, you know, can make a dent here and make a difference because I'm learning a lot and this is appalling. Um, <laughs> hundreds of thousands <laughs> of animals when they have different DNA than us and then they're euthanizing them and breeding them. It's barbaric. Um, Absolutely. What is this? map that I'm looking at, the red, what is this one dot, one lab? Does that mean these are all different animal testing labs? Each yes, dot? absolutely. And you can see on the East Coast, it's a little bit more heavily populated. However, California does have quite a few labs. Um, there are a couple of states that don't have any, uh, like Alaska, but most states do have some level of having labs. And there are about a few, of, like a few under 1,200 entities that use animals in experiments at this point in the United States. So, and this is a 2018 figure. It looks like there's 1,100 labs approximately. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that number has grown? 
Um, I don't know whether that number has grown at this point in time. We have not received the 2019 annual reports yet. So as soon as we have that data, we can update um, our maps. Is there a way to have a mandate in place to stop uh, the reopening of new labs, kind of like the waste waterhouses and wet markets? in New York right now do have laws saying you can't open a new one within a certain amount of square feet, but others are grandfathered in. Is there any way to stop the opening of new labs? So that's a really interesting idea and something that we have certainly discussed. It's more of how do we make that? How do we write that sort of mandate and how would it be enforced? But that is certainly on our radar and we're hopeful that that will be something that we can you know, work with other animal rights groups or animal protection groups and with potentially congressional offices or state legislatures. So, yeah, it's definitely mm-hmm. something worth thinking about. Important work, everything you're doing. Really. You. We're very you excited about, about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I can tell you're passionate about it when you speak. Oh, yeah. um, what is this uh, map here that we're looking at? So this is a map of all of the states in the U.S. and whether they have increased or decreased the number of animals that they have in labs over the past from 2016 to 2018. So as you see in green, dark and light green, they there are a lot of states that have decreased the number of animals, which is an extremely encouraging thing for us. So the dark green has decreased 30 to 95 percent? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's exciting. And then the red and orange, those are increases that we're kind of keeping an eye on. There, is, there are some states that haven't had much change. And again, this is all based on annual reports from the United States Department of Agriculture that we've taken from each lab, aggregated, and then come up with these figures. Now, this is an annual report. So it's not that they're telling us monthly how many animals they have. This is just a yearly estimate. So There are questions about when are these animals euthanized? How are they used? Are they transferred to other labs? Those kinds of questions are mostly unknowns for us. However, we're trying to get as much information as possible about these. Mm -hmm. And what current legislation do you guys have proposed right now? So right now we are working on the Humane Retirement Act. Okay, that's what we spoke about. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we have a couple of other legislative ideas that we are, before COVID-19 hit really hard, we were in the beginning stages of talking to a handful of offices to introduce new legislation. And all of it is exciting and we're excited to work on, but now it's kind of, we're slowing it down until things get back to a place where the offices aren't so overwhelmed with getting necessary supplies about, you know, related to COVID to their districts when that sort of, when things become a little bit calmer where they can be introducing more legislation, we have those conversations started and we are very excited about getting more bills introduced. And the Humane Retirement Act is basically taking these animals, mostly cats and dogs, and ensuring that they are humanely retired from animal testing and that they are adopted out. Yes, absolutely. Do you have any um, research on the behavioral issues of these animals, if any? Are they ready to go to a loving home or do they need to go to a special type of home? Do they need therapy? So that's a fantastic question and a valid concern. At this point, what we have basically implemented, well, what we've done about the Humane Retirement Act is we've gauged interest of particular supporters. So we created a coalition of 13 national animal protection organizations, including us, including the Humane Society of the United States, the Animal Welfare Institute, Eagle Freedom Project, to name a few. And we also reached out to hundreds of different labs or hundreds of different uh, rescues and shelters asking if you, if this were to be passed in any capacity, would you be interested in rescuing these dogs and cats? Would you be interested in taking them into your shelters and finding them homes? And we have overwhelming support. We have a letter right now that's signed by 124 different local rescues and shelters saying, yes, we are ready to do this. We want to take this on. And then we also have the coalition of national animal protection organizations saying, yes, we support this legislation. We don't necessarily know everything about it at this stage. We can gauge as much as we can from the state laws in the 12 states that are currently already implemented. However, it's going to kind of probably be uh, we learn it as we get to do it. And right. Lewis is extremely excited for that. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of things you learn as you go. Exactly. So 
one of the things you said that you, you could speak to is um, at the post-research adoption, the specifically the difference between intramural and extramural research. What is that? Absolutely. So intramural research is research that is conducted at an agency on site. So for example, the National Institutes of Health. Intramural mm -hmm. research would be, com would be completed at the, na at the National Institutes of Health. However, extramural research is research funded by that agency. So while the NIH may have a handful of animals that they're using in tests on site, extramural research applies to all of the organizations, all of the labs that they give federal funding to through grants to conduct this research. So the difference between intramural and extramural research that is so important is that intramural research only applies to a smaller number of animals versus extramural research, which gives a larger, uh, it gives protection to a larger number of animals across different, um, across the whole country. Mm -hmm. And um, you do this legislative roundup, which you, I got the email, which is great, some insightful, but what do you see as the legislative trend? Yeah, that's something that we certainly focus on. And if any of the viewers are interested in receiving that legislative roundup on Neves's page, www.neves.com. I think the Wolf Act, sounds, I mean, the titles are adorable. The Wolf yeah. Act, uh, the Kitten Act, I mean, very- They're clever, for clever sure. Sweet. Absolutely, you got the Puppers Act, Puppy Protection <laughs> Act. They're very um, emotional. They definitely are good names. They're so exciting are these, are these acts actually becoming adopted and turning into law? Is that what the trend is? Or how, how, what do you guys see from the inside working on this every day? So right now, I think it's encouraging to see that there are so many bills that are currently pending. 10 years ago, in 2010, there were three animal protection bills about animal experimentation. However, now there are 15. So we have five times the amount of bills today as we did 10 years ago. However, it's also important to note that the legislative process works on a two year cycle. So at the end of the 116th Congress, which is coming up in a few months, at the end of that Congress, all of the bills that are currently pending are going to be deleted. They're gonna disappear. So it's exciting to see that we have 15 bills pending on the federal level, but it's also a really important time for us in all times, of course, are to remain involved and to mm -hmm. reach out to our representatives and to the people who can change this and can show support and say, listen, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, even though we're afraid and stuck in our houses, these animals are stuck in their cages their entire lives and we care about them too. Please make sure that you're supporting these animals even through this time. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's a little too early to tell what the effect of COVID will have or what the effect COVID will have on all of these bills currently pending. But if they don't get passed within this Congress, there is, they're going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna put up something else on the screen that you had emailed to uh, further explain. Um, I, I went to University of Florida undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm in Florida, you're in Washington DC, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so what what are we looking at here that you have several pages, which I'll we'll click through on the screen for everybody, but um, can you explain to us what we're looking at? I see swine, which would be pig, right? Yes, of course. So this is an example of one of our Freedom of Information Act or open, open records laws requests of which we put in every single week on the federal and state level. This is a result from that. This is showing the mass euthanasia that's currently taking place in labs currently due to COVID. So there are mice on there, there are rats on there, pigs on there. Oh, but right. Wait, mm -hmm. look at this. So the date of birth is this happened during COVID. This, this pig was born during COVID, right? Am I reading that right? 310? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And this pig was also euthanized? Yeah. Wow. So this pig was born and euthanized within what time period? How do we know? Oh, four, eight. So this pig left, lived less than a month. Is that what was I'm right for research. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that looks right. Wow. Do you know why this pig was put down? Do you understand? Right now, uh -huh. our understanding of this is just that 
even though they said that all of these animals are, very are they there. breeding pigs for this as well? Are they breeding? They're breeding yeah. pigs to be tested on. Of course, they're so if they're farm animal animals animal to be yeah. slaughtered for food, and they're breeding the same farm animals to not be. Well, wait a minute. And what happens after they euthanize them? Um, mostly they are incinerated. However, we have seen some evidence of rabbits who've been used in experiments with ticks. And after they are, the ticks feed on the rabbits for however long, they have been sold for meat, human consumption. Meat. Yeah, it is and, twisted. <laughs> it's disgusting. So would the, are there any side effects to the rabbit from the tick that could then transfer to the human that could lead to another pandemic? I mean. I'm sure that they there likely are. <laughs> We don't have records of that because I, if they're experimenting on a rabbit for however long with a tick and then they're selling it to a meat uh, distributor, supplier, then I don't think that they're probably that concerned about whether this could be a pandemic because otherwise they just wouldn't do something like that, uh, right. using it in, and then selling it for humans to eat. And these, how many farm animals are being bred for animal testing, not food? So that is a number, that's a number that I don't have offhand, on hand. Um, however, we do see evidence of goats, pigs, sheep, cows, chickens, basically every animal you can think of except mm -hmm. for mice and rats. And we don't see, we see fish, but they don't necessarily differentiate between which type of fish um, mm -hmm. all the time. So we really see animals that you wouldn't expect to see too. Like we've seen evidence of alligators in labs used in research. We've seen tree shoes. We've seen okay. moles or birds that they capture outside. They find crows and bats and then they just put them in their labs and experiment on them. Wow, okay, I'm gonna put back up here. So this is a dog that we're looking at. And where is this lab? These labs, it says University of Florida. Does that mean these labs are in Gainesville, Florida? Yes. Yeah. Are they related to the university? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. So that's also even even that aspect of figuring out where labs are located can be extremely tricky because they often have multiple sites where the labs are and they don't necessarily they try to be tricky too. They want it to be secretive. And we as an organization are all about transparency. We're very interested in not having things be super secretive. We want the information to be put into the public's hands so that we can make changes and so that mm -hmm. you know, congressional offices can see this is an issue that we really need to be focusing on, but it's definitely, they are sneaky. They do say, you know, we have this lab and it's our main lab, but then you can see how they're connected to five other labs, maybe in the same area or universities sometimes you know, the scientists will go from one university to the other or they'll use the same animals. And it's really, it's a big web basically to try to figure this out. And we've put years and years dedicated to answering these questions. And we come up with new questions every single day, which is nice because work is never boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so a sheep. This, uh, what happened to this sheep? Again, she has no date of birth and was euthanized March 25th, 2020. What does this mean? Substance, ethanol? Is that how they euthanized it? Potentially, yeah, that's what I would assume. Yeah, this is just, it's a long record of multiple individuals who were seen as being less than necessary and could easily be euthanized or they're calling it, they call it culling populations. Yeah. They talk about it together, sacked often, which is, it feels like a deviation of just, it feels like a failure to train, you know, laboratory personnel because they don't seem to be caring mm -hmm. much about the animal welfare. It's more of, it's seen as a business and these animals are seen as nothing more than inanimate equipment. And we think that's unacceptable. What is this? What is this uh, swine? It looks like animals euthanized. They have a bunch of pigs. What, are, what does this document mean? I think it's just showing more that th this one has their cage card numbers on it. So you can see how they're identified 
um, by numbers. Sometimes they're identified by names as well, which we've under uncovered some pretty upsetting names. This is a mouse. Mm -hmm. Lots of mice there too. Mice and rats seem to be the populations that are being yep. the most cold. Here, rats. rats. Yep, and their cage number IDs. Yep, their species. The protocol that they were used in or were going to be used in that now they'll either have to not do that protocol or repurpose those that that money or get new animals for it. More rats, of course. It's yeah, impressive. More, there even lots of rats. Yeah, lots of rats and lots of mice because that's what really makes more those mice. Animals, yep, who make up. And look at all of them. Each yeah. one of those had a very special personality and now their lives are over. Yeah. It's incredibly heartbreaking, yeah. The, there are notes on here. Are these your notes? Um, no, these are not my notes. We do not alter any of the documents that we receive. So these are handwritten notes from the labs. So Kate, let's see if we can make it out. Cage is masked, essential, not able to reach lab. Cage is masked. I wonder what that means. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, through the rest of the guy. More mice. More mice. Yeah, mice. Um, and then it looks like, all right, I'm going to look on the, looks like some of our viewers have some questions here. I'm going to put them up and see if we can ask some of these, answer some of these questions. Okay. All right. Um, here's a question. Oh, let me take down that picture. <laughs> Realistically, what do you think is possible legislatively for the anti-vivisection movement over the next six months? At this point, I think it is a little soon to tell. However, I think the most important thing at this point is to remain involved and to make sure that you're reaching out to your representatives. And if you're unfamiliar with how to do that, you can Google your address. It can tell you who your representative is. Each one of those representatives has a website through which there is an online portal where you can say, listen, I want you to support anti-vivisection. Explain it to them. They might not know what vivisection is necessarily, but say animals in labs for research are not, it's not an acceptable use of animals. So certainly remaining involved, additionally staying involved in other ways as well. Neves has a monthly grassroots organizing training that one of my colleagues, Amy Meyer, puts on. And it's an over the camera, on a computer at your home, no sort of like being social in person. And it's a good opportunity to learn skills so that when everything is over and when things go back to a way that we can leave our homes more easily, you can be involved and you can start campaigns and use this time to really get used to and get excited about what's what you can do afterwards too. A lot of preparation here. Okay, and um, here, what? Here's another one. Why is animal testing ineffective for human disease? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that question. Right now, it's just that the science shows that while animal tests may be successful or seen as successful in one species, that doesn't mean that they're successful in another. We've even seen that in the alternative way too. There are things that work for humans that would kill a dog. So if the animal test was the testing model, if that model was a dog, and then they did a test that's life-saving for a human, then that test would have never gotten to the human because it failed in the dog. So really the, the problem here is that we're a different species. We aren't a rhesus macaque, we're not mice, we're not dogs. Therefore, the number one creature that we could use to get the best information is something we see as so immoral using other humans, which I am not saying we should do, but why isn't that protection also extended to those animals when ultimately the animals are suffering when we're not getting that many cures, especially when there are human relevant alternatives that are coming to the market and that are going to continuously be developed so that this exact problem is answered because ultimately we all want humans to not have such terrible diseases. Okay, um, and here's a good question. It seems like a follow-up question. Um, animals were rescued from a lab last year. How are those animals doing? Do we have an update? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, Neves received, we have an, a confidential adoption partnership program 
through which we take animals legally out of labs and we sign a memorandum of understanding with the lab saying we'll never say where they're from, we won't tell anything about this lab, just that the animal was used in research. So a couple of my colleagues made the trip down to Mexico, picked up some dogs and brought them back up to New England, to Boston and got them into loving homes. And the updates that we get to have relatively regularly are always exciting. The animals are enjoying their homes. They love their toys. They love their families and they're doing a really great job. So we're excited for the next time that we get to get a handful of animals out of labs. Okay, and any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up here? You guys uh, are doing great work. Oh, keep it up. Thank you so much. I guess the only other, I have two things that I'd like to say. The first being, if anybody is interested, any viewers are interested in doing this kind of work, and if you would like to come and work on legislative efforts, Neves is always looking to support that work. So please reach out to me. My email is on the Neves website. I would be happy to have those conversations. And the second thing that I would like to say is right now, Neves is working on the coolest thing that it has done since 19, or 1895, and we're going to unveil it in a couple of months. I can't say too much about it at this stage. However, it's going to be very cool. It has to do with never before seen records about animal experiments from all 50 states that we will be sharing. And we would love to come back and talk about that when the time is right. I'm sure you, you'll be welcome back. So um, this is the website. So this is where everyone can go if they want to sign up, get updates, get involved, um, donate as well. Very, very good cause for everything here. This is where you can donate. And um, so. Good job. Um, and do you have any final thoughts? And then we'll, we'll definitely invite you back at a later date when you have information that you can talk about. Yeah, well, thank you so much for this opportunity. We appreciate it. Thanks we really appreciate all of the Jane Unchained viewers who are so active in this space and helping to protect animals. So thank you for all of your work as well. Yeah, thanks for coming on and keep it up. You guys are thank making you. a real dent. So congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, bye. Bye.